those of you who didn't follow our seminars before summer, I just remind that it is a, a series of web seminars, but now also of in-person seminars taken here in this room. This is the GGI room where now a workshop is running. The workshop is uh, New Physics from the Sky. And uh, we are really happy to have, uh, again, uh, a limited number of uh, in-person participants, but we hope that soon the restriction will be uh, less severe and we can uh, uh, work at full capacity. This is a series of uh, theory colloquia and focus meeting. Uh, please have a look at the program on our website. Uh, the aim is to give a pedagogical introduction to the hottest topics in theoretical physics. Um, and what else? Ah, okay. Uh, we have another uh, news. I have another news to announce. Our organizing committee is uh, bigger than the one uh, uh, before summer. And I'm glad to announce that Valentina Forini from London City University and Humboldt University of Berlin joined us. Uh, so um, that's all for now. So I, uh, we will have uh, Netta Engelbart, Engelart, sorry for the <laughs> spelling, and, but I leave uh, Domenico for the introduction of the seminar. Uh, we will follow you from here. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. And uh, today we're really excited to have Neta Engelhardt from MIT. And uh, she's an expert, she's a world expert on understanding the dynamics of black holes in quantum gravity, in particular in relation with uh, gravity and quantum information in the ads cft correspondence. And her work has been awarded prizes very recently, in particular the Blavatnik Award in 2019 and the New Horizon in Physics Prize this year. So oh, I don't think I have to keep going on and I'm very, very happy to have Netta to start a series of seminars and please. Thank you very much for the, for the wonderful introduction and for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm honored to be the first speaker of the series this year. And I'm very excited as always to give a talk on the black hole information paradox, especially now uh, the past few years have really accelerated our progress on this topic. And it's just always, it's always fun and exciting to, uh, to give talks on it. Now you might ask, what is it in the last few years that has really, um, accelerated the progress on this on this topic. And I, I like to call it the, the age of holographic entanglement entropy, which is an ingredient that has proven to be extremely valuable in our understanding of this longstanding paradox in quantum gravity, the celebrated black hole information paradox. So let me begin with a few more uh, sort of top view uh, motivational statements. So uh, to quote Franz Cordova, uh, black holes are the most mysterious objects in the universe. And uh, here is a beautiful image by the LIGO collaboration of uh, two black holes coalescing. And to really drive the point home, uh, the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for uh, discoveries on, uh, on black holes, uh, Roger Penrose, Ronald Genzel, and Andrea Kiss. So these were, uh, this, this black holes are sort of, we kept our imagination, um, they're really, uh, really exciting and partially because they're so mysterious and uh, and so and relatively poorly understood. Now a few things about what we know and what we don't know and why black holes are so exciting and, and, and important. So black holes serve as a stage for gravitational phenomena that we don't understand. We understand a lot about gravity. Uh, we've had some really exciting and interesting tests of gravity of uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, and of, but of course, black holes are in some sense the most extreme regime and they, they are very good laboratory for uh, gravitational phenomena that we simply don't have a good explanation for at this point. So 
an example, um, very deep inside black holes, or also in the pre-inflationary universe, the general theory of relativity breaks down, and so we don't expect to have a, um, a good description of, of that physics from general relativity. And that means that there's something more that we need to understand better here. And I really want to emphasize this. General relativity is not a complete theory of gravity. And so in particular, when space-time is, is very, very curved, for example, it's curved on the scale of on quantum scales, scales where the Planck, con Planck's constant becomes important, then we can't describe the universe just using this decoupled limit of general relativity and quantum field theory. That's something that we can do in approximately flat space here on Earth. That's not something we can do in very deep inside black holes in the pre-inflationary universe. So a quantum theory of gravity is needed. And then when I say is needed, I really mean needed. Um, we don't have one, okay, go back one. We, we Black holes do exist. We know that black holes exist, um, LIGO and the Ben's Rider Telescope, et cetera. And in order to describe the deep interior of black holes, we need a quantum theory of gravity. Now, we'd like to understand the interior of black holes, but the snag, of course, is that we don't really have an explicit, precise theory of quantum gravity that we understand directly. So, and as I mentioned before, um, this is a problem. Since black holes do exist, that means there's phenomena in the universe that we can't describe right now. And, and we need to, since we know it exists. So our theory of the universe, it's incomplete without an understanding of quantum gravity that describes what happens deep inside black holes. This is sort of the, just the motivation for, um, for studying things like the black hole information paradox. So what is the black hole information paradox and what, what's, what's conflicting with what? So, and our expectation is that quantum gravity doesn't become important until space-time is curved on very, very small scales. So the expectation is that if you have uh, weakly interacting general relativity and quantum field theory, that's a limit that describes you know, planet Earth very well, that the limit that describes the solar system very well, that's a limit that we expect is also well described near the event horizon of a sufficiently large black hole. And this is because we don't expect large space-time curvatures near the event horizon of a large black hole. So we expect that this weakly coupled limit that we call semi-classical gravity is a very good description of the space-time in that region. Now, the information paradox in sort of broadest terms is an apparent contradiction between the predictions of gravity and the predictions of quantum mechanics in this regime where they're not supposed to conflict one another at the event horizon of a black hole where we expect that a limit where the two are weakly interacting is actually valid. And they shouldn't be conflicting one another in a regime where we don't expect that they have much to say about one another. So this is in some sense the, the sort of the coarsest way of explaining the black hole information paradox. It's a, it's a conflict in predictions of two theories in a regime where we don't expect them to have a conflict. So to make this a little bit more precise, if the event horizon were a regime where strong quantum gravity effects were always important, then it wouldn't be a paradox. We would just say, okay, this, this decoupled limit is not valid in this regime, and we just need strong quantum gravity to describe it. The, the fact that we expect semi-classical gravity to be valid at the event horizon means that the predictions of quantum gravity shouldn't have a of quantum mechanics shouldn't have a significant impact on the predictions of gravity and vice versa. And in particular, what that means is that we don't expect that they are, that they should, be, we don't expect them to make conflicting predictions as they should really have much of an impact on one another. And at the same time, we find that this is, this is not what we find. And that leads to a very, um, a very interesting aspect of quantum gravity, one of the most exciting ones in my opinion, which is the fact that they do. And this is a puzzle. So this is a very, very broad description of the information paradox. Let's go one step down with something a little bit more precise, which is the caricature and sort of elevator pitch that you often hear about the information paradox. So you imagine you have uh, two particles, Alice and Bob, um, they're entangled. Alice ends up in the black hole and Bob doesn't. Now, as we'll discuss shortly, uh, black holes evaporate. So if the black hole evaporates, that means it disappears from the system altogether. And we find that even though we had entanglement, uh, it, it has been lost. We say that information has been lost. 
A more mathematically precise way of saying this is that a pure quantum state is appears to be evolving into a mixed state, which is a violation of unitarity of quantum mechanics. And this is a prediction from uh, semi-classical gravity, which again, we don't expect unitarity to be violated. And so we have ourselves a, a conflict here. Now we've never seen violations of unitarity. Um, and I'll, I'll, mention, I'll discuss a little bit more open systems versus closed systems shortly, but unitarity of quantum mechanics is something we expect to be a pillar that, that holds and is valid. Of course, we've also never seen violations of general relativity. So uh, there, is, there is a question of which one, which one has to give here. Now, you can, uh, you can take your own perspective. Um, my personal perspective that is that information loss would be a catastrophic loss of determinism in the following sense. If information is lost, if we lose unitarity, then given the state after black hole, the black hole evaporates, it's impossible for us to post-dict the past. We cannot uniquely evolve the post-evaporation data to determine what happened before the black hole evaporated. Um, so that, 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 that is a loss of information. That means that we end up with less information after the black hole has evaporated than before. And that would mean that physics is not postdictive or the time reverse physics is not predictive. And that's a catastrophic, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, it's a catastrophic loss of determinism for physics. That, so this one, one uh, sort of more philosophical reason to skew towards information conservation over information loss. But either way, whichever uh, nature prefers, black holes exist. And though that means that there is a definitive answer about whether information is lost or conserved. And it's up to us, of course, to find it. Now, ultimately, one of the reasons that we're interested in this isn't just to resolve a paradox, but of course, the fact that any paradox is, uh, stands a lot to teach us about quantum gravity. Paradox means we're thinking about the problem wrong somehow, and resolving this will tell us a lot about things that we haven't understood yet about quantum gravity. The catch-22, of course, is that we have to somehow try to resolve the information paradox without having a full, complete, and direct formulation of quantum gravity. And that sounds hard. So how do we go about doing that? And that leads me to the development of the information paradox before 2019 and what happened in 2019 that made it so much more tractable than, uh, than it was before. So before 2019, the general perspective was that non-perturbative quantum gravity is necessary for seeing evidence of unitarity in black hole evaporation. That basically, if you want to see unitarity, it's got something to do with non-perturbative strongly coupled effects and you have no hope of seeing it otherwise. In particular, the conventional wisdom was that semi-classical gravity just appears to be losing information. If all you have access to is just this weakly coupled limit of gravity and quantum mechanics, it just looks like it's losing information. And somehow, in some way, non-perturbative corrections add up from quantum gravity and eventually it fixes it up so that information isn't lost. This was the conventional wisdom. And in 2019, what, uh, what happened that, that gave us so much, so many tools to work with was a semi-classical, a purely semi-classical analysis that actually is a smoking gun signal of information conservation. And I wanna emphasize that this was done in this regime of perturbative, you know, decoupled or almost decoupled quantum field theory and general relativity. And I think, I, I think it's safe to say that most of us thought that this kind of thing was impossible, that semi-classical gravity just looks like it's losing information. And, um, and what, what, what happened in 2019 is we realized that there are ways to see information conservation or evidence of information conservation in a semi-classical analysis. And that's sort of what triggered a huge amount of activity and, uh, and, and a better, um, progressively better understanding of the information problem. So here's the structure of this talk. I'm going to begin by giving a much more detailed description of the information paradox. This has just been sort of a 30,000 foot view and uh, where the problem stood before the age of holographic entanglement entropy. And then go into the tools that we've obtained from holographic entanglement entropy, why those were so necessary 
what happened in 2019 and since 2019 on the front of the information paradox? And finally, where are we going next, at least in my own humble opinion? So the story really begins, as most good stories do, with thermodynamics. So this is the, a very famous ex uh, thought experiment, Wheeler's Gedanken experiment. And the, the experiment goes like this. In classical general relativity, black holes have no microstates. This is a, a, a sort of fact, you could say. Um, and if black hole has no microstates, then, well, it's got no entropy. Now, suppose you have a hot teacup, which obviously absolutely has entropy, and you throw this teacup into the black hole. Well, black holes have no entropy. So by taking this hot teacup that has some entropy, throwing it into the black hole, you've decreased the entropy of the universe. And in the immortal words of uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There's nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. So uh, Wheeler was very perturbed by the fact that gravity appears to be violating the second law of thermodynamics. And so he went to his graduate student, Jacob Beckenstein, and he told him, um, I would like for you to solve this problem for me. And for the graduate students in the audience, if you ever think your advisor is being a little hard on you, just remember the problem that, uh, that Wheeler gave Beckenstein. But Beckenstein was certainly up to the challenge. And, um, and he proposed that black holes are in fact thermal objects, that they have a temperature and they do have an entropy. But this entropy is not due to classical gravity microstates, but due to quantum gravity microstates. And that this entropy is in fact furthermore computed by the area of the event horizon over four in Planck units. Again, this entropy is supposed to be counting the microstates that are that, that are due to quantum gravity rather than classical gravity. And, and this was a, a really a brilliant insight that, uh, that kickstarted black hole thermodynamics, um, and uh, which is sort of the precursor, one could say, to the information paradox. Now, this is the entropy. And for a black hole close to equilibrium, we expect a temperature that's inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. So I want to just take a, a brief aside here just to mention how important this, this quantum bit here is. In classical gravity, black holes are perfect absorbers. So in particular, that means that they cannot possibly be thermal objects because objects with a temperature have to emit radiation. So this idea that black holes are thermal and have a temperature and entropy at the classic, in the classical gravity, it's, it's a, something of an analogy. But once you add quantum corrections, black holes don't have to be perfect absorbers anymore. And you actually do say that they have a temperature and they genuinely have an entropy. But it's important that you include quantum corrections here because otherwise, again, black holes in classical gravity are perfect absorbers. They don't radiate. Now, you actually, so in order to actually compute the temperature of a black hole, as I said, you have to work with semi-classical gravity in this limit where quantum field theory is very weakly coupled, um, approximately decoupled from, uh, from gravity. Now, let's talk a little bit about black hole evaporation. This is very important for the information paradox. So we say, all right, black holes have a temperature, they have an entropy, and they radiate. Uh, the fact that they radiate is typically because they're thermal objects and they have a temperature. And that means that potentially if the temperature of the black hole is smaller than the temperature, of, sorry, it should be larger than the temperature of its surroundings, then the black hole could evaporate. But the temperature of the black hole is inversely proportional to its mass. So the black hole evaporates, it gets smaller, it gets less massive, it, it gets hotter. And it doesn't stop evaporating until it's completely gone. Again, as the mass shrinks, it evaporates more and more. The mass keeps on shrinking, the temperature keeps on rising, and the process just sort of uh, spirals until the black hole evaporates completely. Now, uh, let's ground ourselves in some numbers here. So what are the temperatures of black holes that we can think of in terms of size? You know, Sagittarius A star has a temperature, a Hawking temperature. It's the temperature of the black hole due to this uh, thermal effect. 
of approximately 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. That means it's significantly colder than the cosmic microwave background, which is the ambient surroundings. A solar mass black hole would be approximately 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin, still, uh, still well, you know, fairly cold. A lunar mass black hole would be approximately at equilibrium with the cosmic microwave background. And a coronavirus-sized black hole would be approximately at room temperature, um, which may be a, a, the birth of some conspiracy theories. I don't know. All right. So in order to talk about um, evaporating black holes, we maybe for, should first talk about collapsing black holes. We want the black hole to form in order for it to evaporate. So here I'm going to draw some uh, 3D diagrams in hopes of illustrating the process of black hole formation and also black hole evaporation. So here in these diagrams, time will always run upwards. It will always increase towards the future. So we start out with the uh, this, this sphere here. So you know, this is meant to be a, a sphere, a star. Uh, at one moment in time, it's just a ball. And with time, whoops, sorry. With time, we imagine that the star is sort of collapsing under the force of its own gravitational field. So the radius of the star is shrinking as a function of time. So this gets smaller and smaller. Again, every cross section here is a single moment in time. The sphere gets smaller and smaller. Eventually, it enters its own uh, Schwarzschild radius and event horizon forms. This gray uh, surface here is the event horizon. And again, the black hole keeps on, the, the star keeps on collapsing until eventually there is a, it forms a singularity. So here again, time is running upwards out, out in this region, and the black hole is sort of collapsing until there's a singularity and an event horizon out here. So this is the picture of a collapsing black hole, the process. And the causal structure, the, the it, I, I sort of said time runs upwards here just to illustrate the, the causal structure of this object. So here are the light cones of observers. So you imagine an observer over here. This is where the light, light rays will, future directed light rays will travel. And that means that an observer can sort of move inside this light cone. This observer will move inside this light cone. This observer will move inside this light cone. And this observer will move inside this light cone, which is another way of saying that the this oft quoted saying that an observer can never escape, or even light cannot escape from a black hole. These are the trajectories of light rays once they cross the event horizon. Now we've talked about black hole uh, collapse and black hole formation. Let's talk about black hole evaporation. So here we have a single moment in time. This is our black hole in black, very creative. And here we imagine we have a bunch of uh, pairs of particles. We can imagine that these pairs of particles is entangled pairs. One of them is behind the horizon. One of them is outside of the horizon. This one outside of the horizon can you know, move away and radiate while the other one remains inside. So this is a picture of a black hole with all of these all of these pairs radiating outside. Black hole is radiating. Eventually, it, it keeps on shrinking as it radiates, and eventually, it evaporates altogether. So, the, so where's the paradox here in this somewhat more detailed picture than what we discussed earlier? So the paradox is what appears to be information loss between the initial state at early time, somewhere down here. And well, you could say already, you know, part of the way through the evaporation, but it's also easy to discuss the post evaporation state here. There appears to be information loss between the two. Now, to see this quantitatively, we want to talk about the entropy of the radiation. So Here's a very uh, sort of oversimplified model, but it, it captures the uh, some of the, it captures qualitatively what's going on here. So let's take an entangled pair of particles. We have Alice and we have Bob out here, and we imagine one particle sort of falls across is across is across the event horizon. So we have uh, we imagine some bell pair, some quantum state of the two of them. They're together. They're in a pure quantum state. And, uh, and they're entangled with one another, maximally entangled with one another. Now, the, the right particle by itself can only be described in terms of a density matrix, right? You have to trace out over the system described by Alice in order to get Bob's, uh, Bob's state. So this is Bob's state. It's a density matrix. It's a maximally mixed density matrix. 
Now, for a density matrix, the von Neumann entropy or the entanglement entropy is the quantity that we're going to be interested in for tracking information conservation and information loss. This quantity, the von Neumann entropy, sometimes we call it the fine-grained entropy, is defined as minus trace of rho log rho, where rho here is the density matrix describing your system. Now, why is this a valuable quantity? Well, for one, it's invariant under unitary evolution. And what that means is that, okay, if it's invariant under unitary evolution and we're looking to see if evolution is unitary or not, then we can compute this and see what happens to it. It also vanishes for a pure state and only for a pure state. So if you start with a pure state, then we better end up with a von Neumann entropy, which is zero. Right? If we start with a pure state, the entropy is zero. It's invariant under unitary evolution. That means we have to end up with a zero entropy at the end if black hole evaporation is unitary. And it's also bounded from above by the thermal entropy, which we also call the coarse grain entropy. So why do we call this information conservation and information loss with some rough intuition? We can quantify in this just again, it's a kind of a very rough qualitative way, the information in a state in terms of the difference between the thermal entropy, which in some sense is maximal ignorance and the von Neumann entropy. So this difference here, we can think of it in, as in some sense uh, encoding the amount of information that we have in a state. So, Again, the thermal state is equilibrium. It essentially has no information content. So that means that if your system starts out with some small von Neumann entropy and evolves to progressively larger von Neumann entropy, then we say that information is lost because it gets closer and closer to being the thermal state, which contains essentially no information content. Another way to think about this is if you think of a pure state as being essentially an entire system, and since a mixed state can always be purified by adding to it an additional subsystem, then the von Neumann entropy can serve as sort of a rough guide for how short we are of having the full system. The intu intuition for why we're sort of missing information if your von Neumann entropy is not zero. Now, this happens all the time in open systems. In open systems, we often start out, you can start out with, imagine starting out with a pure state and the state interacts with its environment and you know you lose information along the way and the, eventually you end up with a von Neumann entropy, which is close to thermal. Von Neumann entropy increases, we say information is lost, but that's okay, it's an open system. There is exchange with the environment and we went from having a lot of information about the state to losing information about it as it interacted with its environment. But of course, the entire universe is not an open system. By definition, the entire universe is the entire system. And so we do not expect that there is information loss in as, as the entire universe evolves forward in time. We expect that the von Neumann entropy of the state of the entire universe, if it starts at some value, it has to end up at that value. And that, will, that leads us essentially to the paradox. In a very sort of simplistic model, just the EPR pair, pair of entangled Alice and Bob, the initial state of the pair is pure, right? We started out with this, this is a pure state. The von Neumann entropy of this is zero. This is the von Neumann entropy of any pure state is always zero. But after the black hole is finished evaporating, the left particle no longer exists in the universe. It's just gone. And so if we consider the entropy, of the entire universe. Well, there's everything that was there before, but now we only have the von Neumann entropy of the pair is no longer the von Neumann entropy of a pair, but the von Neumann entropy of just the right particle, since the left particle is gone. And the right particle is in a mixed state, not in a pure state, which means that von Neumann entropy is not zero. And so we've gone from having a zero von Neumann entropy to a non-zero von Neumann entropy. The entropy has increased and the system could not have been evolving unitarily from before the black hole was, uh, was evaporating to after it's finished evaporating. So this leads me to the, the this is the, the, sort of the toy model of Hawking's calculation. The idea is the following. You imagine you create a black hole from a pure state. It's a pure quantum state, you collapse it into a black hole. And you compute everything 
the entropy of everything outside of the black hole. Well, initially, before the black hole starts evaporating, you could say even before the black hole is formed, this is going to be zero. Entropy is zero, since you have a pure state. Then, as the black hole begins to evaporate, this entropy starts to increase. Now you could say, well, wait a second, how, how could this entropy possibly increase? Well, now we have two subsystems. We have two interacting subsystems. We have the black hole interior, and we have everything outside of the black hole. So the entropy of everything outside of the black hole is actually the entropy of an open system, because there are two subsystems here that, compo that composite the entire system, the black hole and its radiation. So it's OK. The entropy of an open subsystem is allowed to increase. That's all right. So we say, OK, the entropy of, this, uh, of the open subsystem, which is the black hole exterior, the radiation, it begins to increase. No problem. That's not in conflict with unitarity, since it's just part of the system. Now, as the black hole continues to evaporate, what Hawking found is that the radiation entropy keeps on increasing until eventually it plateaus at the thermal value. However, once the black hole finishes evaporating, the entire system is the radiation. Now, the black hole is gone. Now we're looking at the, the, the black hole exterior is literally the entire universe. But if the, if the radiation doesn't have zero entropy after the black hole is finished evaporating, that's the same as saying that the entire universe is not pure, simply because we started with having a pure state down here. And we're asking, what is the entropy outside of the black hole? Well, once the black hole is gone, the entropy outside the black hole is the entropy of literally everything in the universe. And so we find that the end state is not pure. And we evolved from a pure state that has zero entropy to a mixed state that has non-zero entropy. And that means that we, are, we have lost information. We started with a pure state. There was some process in which we had two subsystems that were interacting. But when we look at the entropy again at the end of the process, we find that it is not zero. And so this is a process that violates unitarity of quantum mechanics. So here is the, here's the process. Um, so here we're looking at the time before the black hole has formed. This is our star here. Time again runs upwards. This is our star that collapses. So this is a moment of time snapshot. That's the star. Then during the evaporation process, here we have the black hole. We're computing the entropy of everything outside of it. That's the entropy of all this orange stuff. Then the black hole evaporates. And now we're computing the entropy of everything outside of it. But that's literally everything there is. And yet we're finding that this is thermal. This is the thermal entropy, which is the upper bound of the von Neumann entropy rather than zero, which is where we started. So we have a pure state evolves to, in a, in a, we have a pure state of a closed system, and this evolves to a mixed state. And again, this is a, a sort of a catastrophic loss of determinism and information appears to be lost. So maybe there are corrections, quantum gravity corrections that only come in not perturbatively. So the question we might ask is, well, Suppose that we were able to do a quantum gravity calculation that was unitary, that showed us that, that manifestly had unitary black hole evaporation. What would the entropy look like? Well, this is the Hawking's calculation showing information loss. And what would a unitary process look like? Well, if it starts out at zero, it has to end up at zero again. That's the statement that before the black hole is formed, we have a pure state. And after the black hole finishes evaporating, we again have a pure state. So the entropy begins to, begins to increase, but eventually it has to come back down. So this is the, the curve of the entropy, the behavior of the entropy that would be consistent with unitarity. It's so-called the page curve after Don Page, who first proposed it. So what's the correct curve for quantum gravity? How do we calculate it? And that leads me to the age of holographic entanglement entry. So a bit of a preview here. From the perspective of just pure semi-classical gravity, it's very hard to see where Hawking's analysis is wrong. Um, and by, by that, I mean, we don't we actually have an understanding at this point of what Hawking did wrong to get information loss. The calculation looks, looks good. It, it's very robust. So it seems that 
we need some ingredient from quantum gravity to to come in and tell us where Hawking messed up, what he omitted, what non perturbative corrections come in to fix the problem. And these new developments are actually a semi classical calculation that gives us a the page curve, not the Hawking curve that shows information loss, but a semi classical calculation of the entropy that gives us the unitary page curve, the page curve, which is a sort of a smoking gun signal of unitary evaporation. But you could say, where did quantum gravity come in here? And quantum gravity came in only in how we interpret this calculation. So we're going to now see the details. Now, when I say interpretation, where did this interpretation come from? And the interpretation came from holography, which is one of our best developed uh, approaches to quantum gravity. So what's holography? Well, holography is a duality between quantum gravity, uh, quote unquote, in a box with anti sitter boundary conditions. And the duality relates quantum gravity in a box to a lower dimensional non-gravitational quantum field theory. So we have a gravitational theory in d plus one dimensions related to a non-gravitational quantum field theory in d dimensions. And I'll say these terms a lot. Colloquially, we call the quantum gravity and anti sitter space the so-called bulk. And quantum field theory, we call uh, the boundary. So holography, in some sense, gives us an immediate answer to the information paradox. Holography tells us that a black hole in, with anti sitter boundary conditions is just some quantum system, just a state of an ordinary non-gravitational quantum field theory. That is all it is. It's nothing special at the end of the day. And we know that ordinary non-gravitational closed quantum systems don't have an information problem. Ordinary non-gravitational quantum systems evolve unitarily. And immediately, that means that ADS-CFT tells us, well, black holes are just non-gravitational ordinary quantum states of a closed system, then black holes must evolve unitarily. So information is conserved. Great. Are we done? No, of course we're not done because this is a very indirect explanation. I did not explanation. It's an indirect um, answer to whether information is lost or conserved. But we want to understand how. What is the mechanism in quantum gravity that actually resolves the information problem? How does the information actually get out? What is it? What are the dynamics that Hawking missed? All of these are questions that just having this sort of indirect answer of yes, information is conserved, that, that, that doesn't answer that for us. It doesn't actually teach us how quantum gravity resolves this problem, which is what we really want to do. So let's let's see if ADS-CFT can actually help us understand this better. And we already know if we compute the entropy in our quantum gravity system in the semi-classical limit via the usual formula, so the Riemann entropy of the state of the quantum fields in the bulk from the definition minus trace of rho log rho, that's basically doing Hawking's calculation in anti sitter space. And we're going to get information loss if we do that, right? That is just standard calculation that we did before. It's just semi-classical gravity. It's not using anything about quantum gravity. We're just going to get information loss. So. Again, this is the same picture as before. If literally all we do is compute the Neumann entropy of the state of the quantum fields in our semi-classical gravity system before, and we compute it during, after, outside of the black hole event horizon, and we compute it after, we're going to get this curve, which is increasing and keeps on increasing until eventually it plateaus here. That we know. However, if instead, we compute the Neumann entropy of the dual quantum field theory, it's supposed to be equivalent. We call it the back of the soup can. What we find, of course, is unitary evolution. We compute the state before, we compute the state, the Neumann entropy of the state during, we compute the Neumann entropy of the state after, and we know the evolution of our dual quantum field theory is unitary, which tells us that this quantity is conserved. It's, if it's zero, it was zero here, it's going to be zero here, and it's going to be zero there. And so 
If we do the calculation in the dual CFT, we find that information is conserved. Now, what's the idea here? Well, the idea is that we say, OK, we know if we use this, this way of calculating things, we're going to get information loss. And if we use this way of calculating things, we're going to get what looks like information conservation. And, the, and then the question becomes, how do we take this, this unitary answer and derive it in terms of the gravitational theory? Because again, doing things in terms of the quantum field theory is non gravitational quantum field theory. It gives us answers, but not ones that we can use to really understand the information paradox better. So what does, where does the holographic dictionary actually help us here? Well, the holographic dictionary gives us another way of computing entropies using the gravitational language of the bulk. Another way of computing this quantity that we know is unitary, evolves unitarily, but in terms of gravity, rather than in terms of this dual theory that's very indirect and not especially informative. So what's the basic idea here? The basic idea is to compute the entropy of the boundary quantum field theory from the gravitational theory. We're going to use the holographic dictionary to relate this quantity minus trace rho boundary log rho boundary to gravitational bulk quantities. And what turned out to be remarkably true is that Doing this kind of calculation, you do a, a gravitational calculation, which is holographic, actually gives you what you would potentially expect, which is unitary evolution of this quantity. So what's the, what's the idea here? What's the, what's the, how do we compute this quantity using semi-classical gravity? Right? That's what we want to do. We want to compute this quantity that's of one moment entropy that evolves unitarily through the evolution of the black hole evaporation process. We want to compute that in terms of gravity so we understand better how gravity manages to preserve information. And the critical tool here is finally we get to it holographic entanglement entropy. So the one moment entropy of a density matrix in the boundary theory, row boundary, the thing that we know evolves unitarily with dual to some bulk with perturbative quantum gravity is given by this formula here. So what is this formula? This is the area of some surface chi in a gravitational system over four in Planck units, plus the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields outside of this surface. So here's a surface chi. Here is, so it divides the space time in two. Right, it's a moment of time into. These are quantum fields outside of the surface, row out. And this quantity here is the area of this surface. You can think of uh, maybe the event horizon, for example, that's a surface. The area of the surface over four plus the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields living outside of it. This quantity is called the generalized entropy. Now, of course, not any surface will do. Um, you can compute, you, you can imagine computing this from many different surfaces and getting many different answers. The surface is distinguished in the sense that if you take the surface and you slightly wiggle it, this quantity does not change to leading order in this, per, in this wiggle. So if you slightly perturb the location of, uh, of chi and you compute the von Neumann entropy, it doesn't change to leading order in the perturbation. So it's, it's stationary against perturbations in this surface chi. So this is what we call a quantum extremal surface, and it turns out to be critical for our understand, newfound understanding of the black hole information paradox. So again, the von Neumann entropy of the boundary theory is computed by the generalized entropy, the sum of these two quantities, of the surface chi, which is a quantum extremal surface, a stationary point of this functional. Okay, so we have all the ingredients that we need, and now we're going to put them all together. Again, let's consider an evaporating anti-desitter black hole. So here we have a black hole, and we have this caricature where the particles are, you know, some in, some out, the black hole is evaporating. What does the quantum extremal surface do? Now, again, we care about the quantum extremal surface because what we want is to compute this quantity, the von Neumann entropy of the, of the boundary theory in gravitational language. 
Why? Because this quantity evolves unitarily. If we can compute this in terms of gravitational language, then we have a gravitational calculation of a unitarily evolving quantity in the black hole evaporation process. So that would be a gravitational calculation that's a smoking gun signal of unitarity. That is why we want to do this. So let's ask, what happens? How do we do this? Well, at early times, we ask, what is the quantum extremal surface? We want to compute this quantity. Well, what we find is the quantum extremal surface at early times, before the black hole is even formed, let's say, is the empty set. So that means that the area of the empty set, of course, is zero. And the von Neumann entropy of matter outside of the empty set is the von Neumann entropy of everything in the universe. So we just have the von Neumann entropy of rho all, which is the entire universe on this slice. Now, we, as the black hole sort of evaporates, this von Neumann entropy grows. But something interesting happens after the black hole evaporates more than half its mass. After it evaporates more than half its mass, we get a quantum extremal surface, which is non-trivial, not the empty set anymore. It appears, I sort of drew it over here, sort of um, a little bit behind the event horizon. This is on a moment of time, just if you look at this, uh, at this slice right here, this is the slice, this is the black hole, this is the quantum extremal surface. And the fact that it's slightly inside of the event horizon is, is actually um, is very important. Now, what we find, which is, uh, which is surprising and, um, and was very exciting at the time that we found it, is that the appearance of this quantum extremal surface is enough to actually make the entropy decrease. So without the quantum extremal surface, the entropy increases until it plateaus. But if instead, instead of using minus trace rho bulk log rho bulk, you use minus trace rho out log rho out plus the area of the quantum extremal surface over four. In other words, if you use a quantum extremal surface, then you get a, a change here between these two and the entropy begins to decrease exactly like we would expect for unitary evolution. And so what we find is that using this different formula to compute the entropy gives us unitary evolution, even though at no point did we have to do a calculation involving non perturbative quantum gravity. The calculation was 100% completely within semi-classical gravity. We computed entropies of quantum fields propagating on a curved space time. We computed areas of surfaces. All of these are quantities that we can compute in semi-classical gravity. And we recovered this curve, which, is, which tells us that information is in fact this is, this is consistent with information being conserved. So let's just take a step back and sort of ask what happened here. Um, so here we have the von Neumann entropy of the boundary theory related to this quantum extremal surface formula. And rho out here, that's the state that we compute from semi-classical gravity. Again, this is semi-classical gravity state. This is an area in semi-classical gravity. And this state on its own, without the quantum extremal surface corrections, gives a non-unitary answer. So what I want to emphasize here is we have, we take some classical gravity and it can give us two different answers. One is non-unitary and one is unitary, depending on whether we use the quantum extremal surface formula or we don't. So again, this computes a unitarily evolving entropy. The quantum extremal surface computes a unitarily evolving entropy, even though all of the ingredients that go into it are semi-classical and on their own without this quantum extremal surface actually compute non-unitarily evolving entropy. So the contribution from the quantum extremal surface itself, that is in some sense what saves the day. Now I wanna emphasize the only place where quantum gravity appeared here is in saying that this quantity is actually a von Neumann entropy. This quantity on its own maybe we wouldn't have said that it was an entropy if we didn't have access to holography. We can compute this quantity without quantum gravity, but actually saying this quantity is an entropy, that is where this, this interpretation came in. Interpretation of, the, of this as being the entropy of the radiation, that is where we sort of borrowed 
from quantum gravity. Now, of course, this beautiful fact that we now have a, a, a unitarily evolving entropy, and it's great, but this raises as many questions as it answers. In particular, with this black box, the quantum extremal surface formula, that if we feed it semi-classical gravity, it gives us a unitary answer. It gives us the right answer. But of course, that's more satisfactory than uh, ADS CFT just telling us blankly information is conserved. But at the same time, it's not quite satisfactory because we don't understand why it works. Why does the quantum extremal surface formula work? Why does quantum gravity repackage unitarity in this geometrization of quantum extremal surfaces? And what microscopic Planckian physics is responsible for the success of the quantum extremal surface prescription? If it's in fact true that a direct calculation of the evaporating black hole in the, that manifestly is unitary involves non perturbative quantum gravity, then how, why does it sort of arrange itself and repackage itself into this quantum extremal surface prescription? And I'm going to say, I don't know how much time I have left. I'm going to say just a very, very briefly a few words on some progress on this front and understanding these questions. Why does this work? Why is, is quantum gravity repackaging unitarity in this way? So in order to make to, to describe this, um, so sort of take a step back and ask, how do we generally compute entropies? And one way to do this is the so-called replica trick. In general, in some non-gravitational theory, we can compute the von Neumann entropy using what's the, this replica trick, which essentially involves introducing n copies of your system, and then taking this, computing this quantity and taking the limit as n goes to one. So here, this quantity rho to the n is the state rho on n independent copies, so-called replicas of your theory. So this is a sort of a standard, uh, standard trick for computing the von Neumann entropy. Now, in holography, without going into too much detail, they, their replica trick, um, this, this quantity trace row to the n, can be related to this so-called gravitational path integral, which is a path integral over metrics. Um, but here, e, this is the action. And when we do this, uh, we, which actually does not include me, but um, is um, Hyrie et al. and Pennington et al., uh, found that uh, you can actually justify this new quantum extremal surface, uh, the quantum extremal surface formula, and in particular, the appearance of this non-trivial new quantum extremal surface that leads to a unitary, unitarily evolving um, entropy. You can justify that from this gravitational path integral. You can justify it from this replica trick by introducing n of these copies, taking the limit as n goes to one. But there's a cost. And the cost is that these n replicas have non-trivial correlations, even though these are n independent copies of the same single quantum theory. And it's not clear to us how or whether they should be correlated. So it appears that we sort of a conservation of misery here, where we asked ourselves, how do we, we have this, this problem, we have this formula, this black box that gives us the right answer, and we're asking how do we justify it? And well, we can justify it using this new black box, which brings a new question of why are we seeing that these replicas have non-trivial correlations, even though they appear to be independent, they should be independent of one another. And so um, I'll say just a few words about um, some of the open questions and where I think we're headed with this. So in, in 2D gravity, specifically two-dimensional uh, so-called dilaton gravity, which is the only example that I would say we understand um, more or less exactly, the gravitational path integral is computing sort of a disorder average. It's doing an average over random couplings, an average over theories. And that is uh, something that we that, that, you've, that we've, we see in other systems. For example, in spin classes, you can, again, you see that you have a replica trick, you do an average over theories, and you get these correlations, these apparent correlations between replicas. So here, the reason that we have these cor correlated replicas, these correlated n copies, is because we're doing an averaging. 
And again, you can see this, this correlated replicas um, in spin glasses, some of the work by Parisi, where um, we, we understand sort of where this comes from. But in more general theories of gravity, it's not clear whether we're doing any kind of averaging. What is the average if, if we are doing it? So it's not clear why we're seeing these, uh, these correlated replicas, how seriously we should take that calculation and um, what we're supposed to take away from it. What I would argue is clear is that we actually pin down a key ingredient, a key player in the resolution of the information paradox, which is this gravitational path integral that is somehow justifying the quantum extremal surface formula that was so successful at mimicking unitarity, even though we don't really understand why it works. And so what I would say that we have to understand why the gravitational path integral is so successful at explaining this unitary result. And that means explaining and understanding why it's dominated by these correlated replicas, why those give rise to unitary evolution, and whether their contributions mean that we're actually doing an average over theories in semi-classical gravity, or maybe there are non-perturbative effects that come in and result in, uh, in removing these correlations, or maybe we're doing a different type of average over states. All of these are questions that we have to ask ourselves in order to understand better this calculation that we did that gave us for the first time a unitary answer in, um, in, in the a un, un, evidence of unitarity from a semi-classical perspective in the black hole evaporation process. So what's the current state of the information paradox? Well, if I had to sum it up in one sentence, I would say we haven't solved it yet, but we are a lot closer to where we were before. And here are some open questions that I think are very important and very interesting. And I will perhaps end with, uh, with just mentioning the last one, which I think is perhaps the single most important one, which is the question that we really haven't answered and in some sense haven't even started to address answering, which is we have this great calculation now, which is evidence of unitarity. It's a semi-classical calculation. We're pursuing why it works. We're understanding better and better. But one thing that we haven't answered yet is where was Hawking's mistake? What did Hawking do wrong? And um, as far as I'm concerned, I think that's one of the most interesting questions that we can be answering right now. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so thank you very much for your inspiring talk. It was great, absolutely. And I already see that the hands raised. So I just, Go in just a second. Okay, you will get to be asked, you'll be asked to unmute, in fact. Please, Joachim. Okay, thanks. So thanks for this fantastic talk. That was really interesting. I have a question about how you integrate over the states outside uh, the uh, extremal surface, because you mentioned that that extremal surface is located somewhat inside the event horizon, which means bit, you have yeah. to integrate over some states that are inside the event horizon, but outside the extremal surface. So how is that done? Uh, great. So, so here, what we do is we work in this, uh, in this approximation where quantum field theory and GR are decoupled, approximately decoupled. Not, not exactly the couple, approximately the perturbative, uh, perturbative limit. And we say, well, in this perturbative limit, we know that the, the black hole event horizon is, uh, is nowhere special. That's just general relativity equivalence principle. And so we, we say, okay, we have some, we know we have some state on all of the, on the entire space time. So in particular, go, yeah. so we start out with say with row all, we just evolve um, row all to some time. And here we, we have the entire, we, we, so we have the quantum fields on the entire moment of time slice here. And then what we, what we do is, as you say, we have to, uh, you said we have to integrate, we have to trace out over the, um, the quantum fields in here. Now, um, if your question is, uh, is sort of on a technical level, how do we do that? Then I can tell you that the, the explicit calculation that we did was uh, specifically in, in two dimensions. And we worked where in the, in the situation where the quantum field theory was actually a conformal field theory. 
And so in order to trace out the interior of the surface, which in two dimensions is just a point, so everything behind it, we conformally mapped our, uh, our system to flat space, where all we had to do was compute the entropy of an interval. And, uh, and, then, and then we, again, just conformally mapped it using the conformal, uh, keeping track of the conformal anomaly back to, um, to anti disorder space. Okay, I think Marco has a question. Yes, hi, thanks for the very nice talk. So actually I have two questions. So the first is the following. So you have been, you have been assuming uh, when you introduced the very nicely the black hole information paradox that the pure state can form a black hole. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, which um, probably makes sense. I mean, I'm not against this assumption, but I wanted to ask, do we have uh, enough evidence that this is actually the case? <laughs> Because but if that's... simply not, then uh, just the only information paradox is not there. Well, it might not be there. So can you comment on that? Sure, sure. That's a very good question. So I, I, you don't have to assume that the state um, is pure. It's, uh, it makes for, pe for better uh, pedagogy. But um, let me go to wherever I have my uh, talking picture. Uh, there it is. Um, so here, I wanted to have the um, I wanted to have the problem be as dramatic as possible, which means starting with the zero entropy and ending up with the thermal value. But if you want to start with a mixed state, that's fine too. You start out with some other value up here. But as long as the final entropy is not the same as the initial entropy, then you're going to have a paradox. And so it doesn't matter if the initial entropy is zero or not. So zero is just better uh, pedagogically. It's easier to see, ah, this is not zero, so you're done. But if you start out with a black hole in some mixed state, and the entropy at the end of the day is higher than it was initially, then you have a problem because uh, the von Neumann entropy is conserved under unitary evolution, regardless of whether it starts at zero or it starts at five or it starts at 5,000. I think you had a second question though. You're muted, Marco. You're muted, sorry. Okay, sorry, there was a problem with them. No so yes, but in case, no, I understand what you said, but just before coming to the second question, but in principle, you may have that the, you, you, somehow at the end of the looking, the, the, the final uh, entropy is going to be equal to the one that you start with. So uh, it's not, a, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you, you might, uh, no, this is a possibility. It's not obvious that, uh, so you need some uh, decrease, but, uh, uh, so if the final qualitatively can be different, right? If the final entropy is equal to the initial entropy, then I would say that's uh, that's consistent with unitarity. But since the the Hawking calculation shows here that the final entropy always uh, is always the maximum, it's always saturated the maximum is the thermal entropy. As long as you start out with something that's not exactly the thermal entropy, and you just follow Hawking's calculation, you'll arrive at a contradiction. Okay. So the second question is slightly more technical. Uh, so you, you introduced the, the holographic system, but we know that a black hole in ADS actually does not really uh, mm -hmm. evaporate yeah, because yeah. it was in thermal mm -hmm. equi equilibrium. So, uh, well, of course you are aware of this. So uh, can you say a few words on how mm -hmm. you get rid of with some external source, I guess, how do you That's do right. this? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so the way we, do, we, we deal with this um, is we take the, an ADS black hole, which, as you astutely say, does not, uh, does not actually, a large ADS black hole, which is the ones that we understand, don't actually evaporate because uh, you have reflecting boundary conditions at the ADS boundary and the radiation kind of bounces back, right, goes right back in and the black hole uh, equilibrates. So essentially the way we do this is you can think of it as we, we just um, couple, we, 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 instead of having reflecting boundary conditions, we have um, transparent boundary conditions between the black hole and a non in, in a, 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 a CFT in its ground state. So, in other words, we have a cold bath, and we put sort of put it at the boundary of ADS, and then we put transparent boundary conditions so that we allow interaction between the two. Now, this means that the black hole evaporates into this bath. So, what we expect to be um, so the, the entropy that we expect to compute to compute is um, has to be an entropy of everything that makes it into the bath because the black hole on its own is now an open system. So we have to be careful in terms of what we consider to be the full system, 
once we couple the black hole to the auxiliary system. So now we have an auxiliary system. The full system is both the black hole and the auxiliary system. But we can easily correct for that just by saying, okay, we're going to track the entropy of you know this piece or this piece or the whole thing. Um, but but that is how we end up forcing the black hole to evaporate. We just we when, once the radiation reaches the asymptotic boundary, it just continues into this uh, this this ground this cold bath. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that Tom has a question. Hi, hello Neda, and thank you for the amazing talk. You know, wonderful. Uh, I'm a little bit curious about those replicas, you know, appeared in the gravitational path integral. What are those? Are they like different configurations of, of the gravitational field, like some wormhole stuff or other? Yeah. Yeah, so these are wormholes. Um, exactly. Let me just go down there. There it is. So here we imagine that we're working um, in Euclidean time. So these are... Uh, so, so these, these wormholes that form between these replicas are actually um, Euclidean wormholes. And these, the reason that these are the sort of uh, problematic for us because is, is that they, they mean that observables that we expect should factorize between these different theories in Euclidean time actually don't. Um, so these, but these objects you're absolutely right, these are different topologies. Um, and instead of, so we start out with these n independent copies and what we do is we ask, okay, this is the boundary um, of our system and how does the gravitational path integral choose to sort of fill in the boundary. And what it should do in consistent with uh, the fact that they're independent is it should fill it in in such a way that it is not connected, that these boundaries are not connected. But what it wants to do instead um, is actually fill it in in a way that there are wormholes that are sort of between these, uh, these replicas. Um, and so we end up having these wormholes in Euclidean time which are uh, replica wormholes is what we've been calling them. And, uh, and these give rise to these non-trivial uh, correlations between them. Oh, then there's one more question from Azadeh. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Neda, for the for the amazing talk. Um, uh, I'm wondering if, if on a technical level, we know how to calculate this quantum extremal surface for a given, let's say, for example, a stationary black hole or, or a given geometry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, certainly, so there are two. I guess there are two different answers I want to give to this question on the two different levels. So um, let me begin by giving the easy question answer, which is that for a stationary black hole where your quantum fields are in the hard Hawking state, um, the quantum extremal surface is just the bifurcation surface. So that's an easy one, just basically, we can, uh, we can use symmetries to figure that one out. Now, um, more generally for say an evaporating black hole, which is manifestly non-stationary, the calculation is, um, is more involved and it can be difficult to do in, um, in higher dimensions. But in, for example, in two dimensions, which two dimension dilaton gravity with a conformal field theory, we can think, which we can think of as a dimensional reduction of a, a certain four dimensional black holes. We can actually do the calculation explicitly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so what this, what this means doing the calculation explicitly, it means computing uh, where this quantity is actually extremized, which means you have to compute the Venoman entropy for arbitrary chi and the area for arbitrary chi and the sum of this and then vary over all chi. In two dimensions, this is particularly easy because chi is a surface and a surface in two dimensions is just a point. And, uh, and that means that you can, you can just, so computing the Bonnevin entropy for all possible points is just an, a matter of computing the entropy of all intervals. And there's a very, a very beautiful formula for this, uh, carbon calibracy, and we know how, so we know how to do that. So in two dimensions, we can we can actually do this explicitly the calculation. In higher dimensions, um, in three dimensions, I would I would guess so. There are some calculations in certain cases. Um, if you have certain symmetries in the problem that you can constrain the shape of this object, then you can probably also do the calculation. In four dimensions and higher, we have a, a, a slight problem, which is that we it's, it's hard to talk about the von Neumann entropy of gravitons, which contribute in four dimensions and higher. So, um, so that can be complicated. But at the very least, we certainly know how to compute the quantum extremal surface explicitly in, um, in dimensional reductions of four dimensions to two dimensions.
Also that you are muted now. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there was another question from uh, Louis, I think. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, thanks, Nella, for the talk. It was great. Um, I was uh, just had a quick question to make sure I understood uh, the subtlety between, you know, having a, a system that evolves uh, such that its entropy is volume and entropy is constant and, and unitarity. Because um, I'm guessing the information paradox at its core, it, some, well, one way maybe of, of looking at it is thinking, well, I have a an out state at post evaporation, and I want to retrieve the in state. I want to retrieve the, the mm -hmm. information, right? What, what was thrown in, and I see that I see that it's a very big accomplishment. I mean, it, it's great um, that we were able to find now a page curve that essentially to, where the entropy goes down to zero. But you said that this is like a, a smoking gun of, of unitarity. But I was thinking about, um, for example, thermalization uh, in uh, even just in like regular uh, multi-body systems, where, for example, you might have say two bodies, and they um, are in a, they start out of equilibrium, um, but they aren't. But but the total state is a pure state, it's like a product state, for example. And then you can let that thermalize such that now it's some maybe like entangled, uh, uh, you know. Uh, plus minus plus uh, like a minus plus kind of state, something like that. And that seems to me that it's now reached an equilibrium because it's thermalized. And therefore, if you evolve it forward or backwards in time, you won't get the initial state. However, you still have as a whole a system that has zero entropy, right? It's still, it's still pure state. So this, I'm guessing, is, is that what you were saying here is that we found that we have that zero entropy at the end, but we don't necessarily yet have the way back. It, it, that's that's why I guess it doesn't yet mean that we're able to but, get the information back, the initial information, is that right? Um, yeah, so, so um, the, the short answer to your question is that having the page curve is not identical to having a precise unitary map that yeah. actually takes you through the, you know, from the post evaporation time to uh, all the way down through the evaporation process. Um, that's the page curve is sort of, uh, is, you know, it's a smoking gun signal. It's great indication that, the, this, that this evolves unitarily, but it's not equivalent to unitarity. Um, and, and so in particular, one, one example is that you could imagine you start with a pure state, you end up with a pure state. So the entropy goes up and then comes down, but the pure state at the end is not unitarily related to the pure state at the beginning. Mm. So that's an example of a situation where you might imagine unitarity is not, does not hold, but you get a page curve that mimics unitarity. Now, of course, do we think that's what's happening? Not really, because the details of the page curve that were calculated, you know, are very consistent with unitarity and unitary considerations. But we have to be careful and not, you know, overstate the result, which is that we did not derive, you know, from semi-classical gravity, a unitary evolution. We derived a, an indicator of unitarity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I believe that your him has another question. Yeah, if I may ask a second question. Um, I was wondering about uh, what happens when this extremal surface forms. You mentioned this happens when the black hole has lost about half of its mass or so. Uh -huh. I assume this starts out with an area of zero, but then, but you also mentioned that it's somewhere halfway uh, it jumps, below yeah. the event horizon. So is that because of the, the funny way that space time is twisted inside the horizon? So, so what happens is that there's actually, so there's, the, so there's the empty set, which is one quantum extremal surface. Mm -hmm. And um, shortly before the black hole has evaporated half its mass, a new quantum extremal surface sort of nucleates. Um, so there's now a surface behind the event horizon that nucleates that, um, that now quantum extremal. It doesn't begin to dominate this formula. So this formula is dominated by the minimal quantum extremal surface. It doesn't begin to dominate this formula until about half, uh, until a little over halfway, uh, half of the black hole has started evaporating. Um, we could say half. Oh. Um, and so, so, but, but the, the important thing is that there's sort of a, um, an abrupt transition between when the empty set is dominant and the new quantum extremal surface, which is not the empty set, uh, dominates. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but the the the, uh, the new quantum extremal surface is it starts out with some area, and then that area grows until it becomes larger than. Well, so, the area of the null surface. 
Um, yeah, so so yeah. The, the, the it's actually the small the minimal one that dominates. Mm -hmm. So the <clears throat> the empty set has so much entropy at that point mm -hmm. that and the quantum extremal surface, even though it has an this area contribution that the empty set does not, because it has a much smaller um, von Neumann entropy, it actually ends up having a smaller overall generalized entropy, and therefore okay, ends up it. being the dominant one. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, I think Alessandro has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, considering the holographic prescriptions for calculating the entanglement entropy of the radiations, it seems that after the page time, some of the degrees of freedom of the radiation are inside the black hole, inside the quantum extremal surface. Mm -hmm. and, and this so solve the solves the paradox. So uh, is it true? And if, if yes, how is, how is it possible? Um, so you're talking about basically the reconstruction. Um, in, in, you know, in, in, in holography, we say uh, that you know, the parts yeah, of the yeah. boundary can sort of reconstruct. Yes, it's true. The radiation is now, um, in some sense, re is reconstructing everything behind the quantum extremal surface. Um, this is true. And this appears to be the way that holography works. It's, it's, it's sort of it's a bit of a modification of how we thought it works initially, but um, it does appear to be the case that, that this is how it works. Yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions or comments, I would really like to thank Meta for a talk. It was absolutely inspiring. That's really the word. And uh, I, I'm really happy that we had you for restarting a series of colloquia because it was a great start. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you everyone for being with us today. And uh, we'll have another colloquium next week. Thank you again. Uh, thank no. you. Okay. Let me let me just say uh, that I, I would like to thank Meta. It's uh, it was uh, the, the right way to start again for. Uh, the, the GGIT breaks. Thank you for answering all the questions. So this is the right, what, what we want. And the next talk will be here, given by this room by Savas Dimopoulos next week. So thank you very much to all of you and have a good night. Bye, everyone.